Well, what a, a great honor to be here. Thank you to, well, thank you Tara for the very kind introduction and thank you to IIED for the invitation. Um, it, it's really an honor to, to, to be here uh, today and deliver this, um, this lecture um, and coming after such gigantic <laughs> or giant uh, women, outstanding women, um, uh, other women that which have done much more than I have. Um, so it's, it's, it's a true honor. Um, it's also high stakes for me, this lecture, because for the first time, I actually have one of my daughters in the audience here, so. <laughs> um, Barbara, as we have seen, it's also, it was an extraordinary uh, film. Um, and and the, the quotes and her intervention in that interview um, really speak to her having been a woman ahead of her time. Really a visionary woman uh, who first articulated sustainable development and its vital link to economic uh, progress, uh, laying the groundwork for modern environmental policies. A woman that was considered radical at the time because of ideas which I will expand quite a bit on, on transferring wealth from developed to developing nations alleviating poverty as a global good and linking personal and planetary uh, prosperity. I believe that to truly honor her, we need to build on the cornerstone that she laid down. And I'll start here um, with my personal calling and commitment. I think most of us in this room have had moments in our lives when we realize that certain issues are much bigger than ourselves and that speak to our essence as human beings and compel us to act. Or as Barbara once put it, moments that widen our understanding and solidarity. One such moment for me was witnessing extreme poverty in refugee camps during Angola's civil war. I saw poverty like never before. I saw it in the eyes and the bodies of people, people that are just like us, who had done nothing to deserve their plight. But meanwhile, just a few kilometers away, others lived in opulence. The haves with materially abundant lifestyles and the have-nots that were digging through the garbage to find some food. I was, a master's of I was a master's student of international development doing primary research for my thesis. But this stark social injustice touched me quite deeply and drove me to devote my energy and skills to global development. To contribute to a world where everyone has their fundamental needs met and can realize their potential a world where social justice is honored and acted upon. A second decisive moment was living in Mozambique, a hot spot for climate disasters and experiencing firsthand the destruction of the massive floods in 2000. Some of you might recall because it, it came quite prominently in the media. In fact, there was a lady, if you recall, Rosita that gave birth on a tree. I saw what numbers in reports and the media can never capture. People who actually loved, lo lost loved ones, they lost their homes and they lost their livelihoods. People who were unable to access their farms, the markets, the schools, the health facilities. I was already working in development, but that triggered my interest and curiosity about the linkages between dev development and environmental phenomena, which led me to learn about the science, policy, and economics of climate change. And that pool has remained with me ever since. I have not looked back. I have focused my professional career on working at the intersection of development, social inclusion, and climate change. And I suspect many of you here today share similar experiences and resolve, which is why it's an honor to be here today. And thank you for 
investing your precious time to be here. So let me just um, walk us through um, where we are, or at least my interpretation of where we are in terms of development, wealth distribution and climate change. In terms of development, it is true we have to recognize and hence rolling while he was alive, he has always done remarkable work in terms of actually putting the data out there. Um, we have seen quite remarkable reductions in poverty. The number of people living in extreme poverty fell by more than 1 billion from 1990 to 2015. From 1.9 billion to 740 million. We have also seen impressive improvements in average life expectancy, in infant mortality, in literacy rates, in women's right to vote, or in serial yield as just some examples. Yet, over 2 billion people today are still poor or near poor, and they face persistent threats to their livelihoods. Roughly the same number of people lack access to safe drinking water services. More than 1.3 billion people live in deteriorating agricultural land, which puts them at risk of depleted harvests that can lead to worsening hunger, poverty, and displacement. And around 750 million people live without electricity, something that for those of us who have never lived without probably is even difficult to imagine. Around 20% of the world's children live in extreme poverty, according to UNICEF. And speaking about wealth distribution, I don't know if anybody from Oxfam, Oxfam is here in the room, um, and they have been doing quite a great work at documenting this. The world's richest 1% have more than twice as much wealth as almost 7 billion people. Where are we in terms of climate change? I studied paleoclimatology, so I take an interest in the historical record of climate. The amount of CO2 in the atmosphere reached 417 parts per million in May 2020. The last time CO2 levels exceeded 400 parts per million was around 4 million years ago during an era called Pliocene, when global temperatures were two to four degrees centigrade warmer and sea levels were 10 to 25 meters higher than they are now. The International Energy Agency has predicted that with today's policies, the world is set for a 2.5 degrees centigrade temperature increase. And UNEP, not far off, estimates a 2.8 degrees centigrade increase. So we are right there in that range of two to four degrees centigrade. And we have more than 650 million people around the world living in low-lying coastal areas. What's more is that we are emitting carbon at unprecedented scale and speed. We have put 100 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere in the last 60 years alone which is 100 times faster than previous natural increases. As I was going to COP last year, I was going through um, the science. What is the latest science? And we know we have reports like the IPCC. We try to bring it all together. But I, there are some scientists that um, I learned with when I went back to university and was looking at the science of climate change, which to me are quite credible, one of which you probably have heard of, James Hansen. These scientists say the world may unavoidably reach the 1.5 degree centigrade limit by 2029, rather than the mid-2030s. And in such a scenario, global emissions of carbon dioxide would have to reach net zero by 2034, not 2050, as is currently expected. So as you can see, already with the current policies, IEA, UNEP, others are saying, we are on a 2.5 to 2.8 trajectory. But 
some very credible scientists out there are saying we need to be much more ambitious even. Why does this matter? The, the, the planet Earth has been warmer, as we have seen four million years ago. Um, why does it matter? Because the impacts are clear and they will get much worse. Today, disasters push 26 million into poverty each year. And today, low and middle income countries lose some 390 billion a year when disasters knock out power and water and disrupt transport. A coalition of the 55 most vulnerable countries, climate vulnerable countries, has estimated they lost at least $525 billion, equal to one-fifth of their GDP since 2000 due to climate change. We might remember two years back, Pakistan suffered record flooding that covered a third of the country, affecting 33 million people. This was one episode, one flood one episode of floods, causing 1,739 premature deaths, including more than 500 children. And the estimated costs of this single event were above $30 billion. But let us not kid ourselves. This is not just happening in low and middle income countries, even if they are being disproportionately hit. According to the National Oceanic, Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, since 1980, the United States has experienced 338 weather and climate disasters causing damages in excess of $1 billion each, when we adjust that for inflation means a total cost of more than $2 trillion. And almost 50,000 people every day are being forced from their homes by shocks like drought, hurricanes, and landslides. Most of them would stay where they were born, where they have constructed their lives. They are being forced to move. As if these impacts weren't already enough, over the past five years, we have lived through two additional major shocks, major shocks the COVID-19 pandemic and Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The unsustainable exploitation of nature, driving devastating biodiversity loss, deforestation and climate change, has created the conditions that accelerate the emergence of new viruses and diseases. In fact, 60% of known infectious diseases and 75% of emerging infectious diseases are zoonotic. And they are already causing damages. Over the last two decades, even if it doesn't, doesn't come very reported in the media, they've already caused economic damage of around $100 billion. So we have to understand that the drivers of climate change are also drivers of the pandemics and both constrained capacity of governments to respond and invest in development and climate action, which in turn further exacerbate the impacts of not responding to either. Russia's invasion of Ukraine triggered severe price shocks in food, energy, and fertilizer markets, which caused a, a global cost of living crisis and ultimately a debt crisis, which is very much prevalent today. But what might not be as well known is that climate extremes were among the compounding factors for food shortages in the immediate aftermath of the war in Ukraine and pushed 57 million people into acute food insecurity and created a ripple effect felt in food prices across the globe. For the first time in decades, because of these two episodes and the compounding effects of climate development. From 2020 to 23 alone, these crises saw 165 million people fall into poverty. Let me come back to the debt situation caused by this crisis because this is something that is really critical today. This year, the average low 
income country will experience inflation of over 8%, according to the IMF recent statistics. And they will spend over twice as much on debt servicing as they do on social assistance. As a matter of fact, the average total debt burdens among low and middle income countries increased by roughly nine percentage points of their GDP during one year, the first year of the pandemic, compared with an average increase of 1.9 percentage points over the previous decade. But this is not just a matter of the quantity of the debt that is disproportionately impacting these countries. It's also the terms under which they are being forced to borrow. As the Prime Minister of Antigua and Barbuda, Gaston Brown, asked the UN General Assembly following Hurricane Irma, which devastated his country, and I'm going to quote, where is the justice in large, wealthy countries borrowing on their capital markets at 3% while so-called high-income small island states are forced to borrow commercially at 12%? This is not a one-off episode. It's structural. On average, developed countries spend 3.5% of their revenues on interest on their debt versus 14% of their revenue in least developed countries. And these same countries, the most climate vulnerable countries, are spending more paying off their debts that they are receiving in climate finance. And again, these debt burdens are constraining the countries from investing in basic services, social in hand, through the transfer of wealth from the richer world to the poorer. I'm going to quote her again. How, she asked, can we speak to those who live in villages and slums about keeping the oceans, the rivers, and the air clean when their own lives are contaminated at the source? And I would add this. While national sovereignty might provide rights of self-determination for nations to pursue their own paths, we cannot sever the threads that bind us on a fundamentally human level. This idea that one person, one community, one nation living in deprived and poor conditions is isolated from those in affluent countries is an affront to our own humanity. It's also an affront to the basic understanding that climate change is borderless. So we are ignoring our unity at our collective peril. If we need some data, here's some data. Low and middle income countries are on track to run on 70% of the world's energy supply. And they represent 60% of total GDP. The world needs to invest trillions, according to some estimates, around 90 trillion by 2030 in sustainable urban energy, transport, water, and other infrastructure assets. Well, two-thirds of these investments will happen in middle, in middle and low-income countries. For our collective good, we need to make sure that low- and middle-income countries avoid lock-in and can leapfrog high carbon infrastructure. Without support for sustainable development, these nations are likely to follow the high emission pathways of their predecessors, perpetuating the climate crisis for all people. And as Barbara rightly said, we need to think about solutions that are all encompassing, that reflect the connections between observed impacts at micro level with the structural and macro levels. This recent compounding crisis, which as I've said, led to the first reversal in development in decades, and a massive debt crisis that once again jeopardizes the development and climate aspirations of low and middle income countries. And the response to this crisis brought to light, once again, the structural problems in our economic and financial systems. A system of economic growth that delivers for few, that is founded on ecological destruction and persistent social injustice, 
is not a foundation for human well-being and prosperity. And prosperity that needs to consider both intergenerational and intergenerational generational dimensions. An economic system that continues to be primarily anchored on a metric, gross domestic product, that fails to reflect the real welfare losses from deep and increasing income inequality, to adjust for the depletion of natural capital, to capture the external costs of pollution and long-term environmental damage, to account for non-market services such as domestic labor or voluntary care, among others. Or a financial system that systematically disadvantages low and middle income countries by moving investments away from them. Let me just give you an example. Again, a metric. And metrics are important because we work towards achieving some metrics. So we put measures in place to achieve certain goals according to certain metrics. Another metric is an ESG system, environmental, social, and governance, um, which, and more and more studies indicate that, was designed for the high income world and fails to accurately and, fail, and fairly represent the rest of the world. Some colleagues of mine, when I was at the World Bank, they had concluded a study that found that sovereign ESG scores suffered from ingrained income bias. Although these scores were designed to measure a country's sustainability, they are 90% explained by the country's level of development. But these matters because investors actually use these ESG scores to make their investment allocations. And so what does this mean? That this approach results in a reduction of allocations to the countries where actually these resources matter and countries committed to, in, to sustainability and environmental investments. Breaking the debt cycle, responding to climate change, and meeting our shared development goals require a transformative socioeconomic shift that is unprecedented in scope and scale. I think many have come to realize that the current system no longer meets the demands of 2024, and really, frankly, caters primarily to the interests of a few. <laughs> Throughout last year, and even before, leaders and institutions have acknowledged that the financial system isn't fit for purpose. Yet, much like our efforts against climate change, it's not happening fast enough. So in my view, what we need is a solidarity pact between high income and low and middle income countries, a financing package that is historic in scope and scale, and that is akin to a Marshall Plan. A pact that offers robust support to countries battling the twin crisis of climate change and debt. A pact that respects the sovereignty of nations and their right to make their own decisions so that they are responsible and accountable to their own people while responding to our global common responsibility to keep temperature increases to below 1.5 degrees centigrade. A pact that recognizes that those least responsible for the climate crisis should bear the least of its debt. And that when countries are trapped in poverty, food insecurity and ecological degradation, they need more fit for purpose finance terms. A pact that replaces the heavy chains of high interest loans with the blend of grants and concessional finance. A pact where the private and public sectors work in tandem to ensure that the transition to a low carbon economy is both affordable and equitable. A pact that deliberately supports social businesses in the form of enterprise based on human virtue of selflessness as championed by Mohammed Yunus, a pact that recognizes that increasing wealth concentration is dangerous because it threatens human progress, social cohesion, human rights, and democracy. And that recognizes that the growing wealth gap deepens mistrust, resentment, and anger, pushing the world towards social upheaval and increasing the likelihood of conflicts within and among nations. 
Countries mobilize significant stimulus packages and the combined power of the public and private sectors to develop and deploy vaccines with historic speed during the recent COVID-19 pandemic. Countries also mobilize significant resources to respond to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. But we haven't been able to respond in a commensurate way to the fiscal and debt burden faced by low and middle income countries. This lack of necessary scale in international solidarity has been pervasive for decades. And it has decreased trust between developed and developing countries. It's driven polarization and protectionism throughout the world, and it's undermining multilateralism. We should not allow this to continue. Failure by nations to achieve on time the previous goal of mobilizing $100 billion annually for climate investments in low and middle income countries might now beg the question, if it was already so difficult to mobilize $100 billion, how will the international community be able to mobilize even more? And these are the discussions that are happening right now in terms of the new collective quantified goal. But it's not for lack of ideas or opportunities, really. Over the years, many experts and high-level panels have made several suggestions and estimated the impact of suggestions from taxes on financial transactions to taxes on fossil fuels to taxes on the super wealthy to taxes on air transport to phasing out fossil fuel subsidies. <laughs> We have invested $3.3 trillion in fossil fuel subsidies since 2015. Imagine channeling these resources for the purposes of development and climate action. So it's not the lack of ideas or opportunities. What we need is the determination, political will, and public support. As the Prime Minister of Barbados, Mia Motley, has stated, we must act with unprecedented urgency. We have the solutions from levies on heavy emitting sectors to innovative financing mechanisms, what we need more than ever is the courage to implement them for global prosperity. <laughs> the time for bold action is now. We must work together to forge a future where economic justice and environmental sustainability are not mere goals, but realities of our people. I have seen myself the power of solidarity at the two large multilateral climate funds that I've had the privilege to lead for a decade now. Boldness from more affluent economies that made available several billion dollars of concessional finance, the scarcest and most vital source of financing, has empowered champions in government, private sector, and civil society to make bold investment decisions themselves. I've seen this since 2008. Countries have been making, developing countries, with these resources, they have been making investment decisions that would be unthinkable. Investing in renewable energy at that time, where the costs was mu were much higher than they are today or in recent years, was unthinkable. But they were making these decisions, both governments and private sector. We also have on our side important levers that we should pull. And allow me just a couple more minutes to present some of them. When confronting a threat to their health or well-being, citizens will press for change. In fact, in my view, we have barely harnessed the linkages between climate change and health to propel people to act and demand action from others. We have new technology, such as satellite imaging or ocean sensors that provide a view of our planet at extraordinary resolution. And this ability of us to track and have access to data that we didn't have before are actually making previously invisible impacts of climate change visible and providing the opportunity to enable enhanced decision making. We also have a shift in terms of power paradigms. Old power held by a few and jealously guarded, closed and inaccessible is giving way to new power, which is made by the many, power that is open, participatory, and peer-driven. And this new power dynamic creates opportunities for climate action at all levels, local, global, and we should really empower them. 
We have technologies of decentralization such as blockchain and crowdsourcing that cut out the necessary middlemen and empower new networks. And these also offer important opportunities. Blockchain is being used for smart peer-to-peer -peer and peer-to-market contracts and will fuel, is already fueling new experiments in distributed ownership or financial transactions. <coughs> we have the compelling business case for climate action. It's interesting, I'm gonna pick on the largest two economies in the world. Wind turbine service technicians and solar photovoltaic installers are the fastest growing jobs in the United States. And China now has 35% more people working in clean energy than in oil and gas. Corporations that actively manage and plan for climate change secure an 18% higher return on investment than companies that don't. And 67% higher than companies that even refuse to disclose their emissions. We know how important it is to empower women. We know that communities and frameworks that tap into the organizing ability and knowledge of women will succeed better at climate action efforts than those that continue the status quo of underrepresentation. And we know the power of empowering youth. 42% of our global population is under 25. And we have seen youth movements that have been at the heart of some of the most earth-shattering global change over the last century. And in this age of viral communications and mobile phone culture, young people are taking to the internet and social media at greater and greater speeds to build new movements and act, enact social change. A new lever for us. By tapping into these levers with the appropriate quantum of financial support, as well as quality in the delivery of this finance, through improved agility and simplification of access, a focus on the poor and most vulnerable, the empowerment of the private sector, and a shift from a do-it-alone, transaction by transaction, to co-creation of investment opportunities, we can actually rise to the historic moment in front of us. This is the vision I laid out for the Green Climate Fund shortly after becoming its new executive director in August last year. And that is the reform agenda we are implementing. The socioeconomic transitions required to meet our development goals and respond to the climate crisis are unprecedented, as I said a couple of times. And we can only deliver with social justice at the heart and core of what we do. We have seen communities and people reject measures that are important from a climate perspective because we are not looking at social justice, because we are not looking at, a just, at just transitions. But if we do so, this will help us realize that a life of shared prosperity, a life of connection to our communities and broader humanity is the one that actually brings us purpose, fulfillment and happiness. A prosperous world is a world where human beings can flourish, achieve greater social cohesion, find higher levels of well-being and still reduce their material impact on the environment. Our future does not depend primarily on governments or powerful corporations. It depends on our individual agency because our decisions matter. How we educate our children, how we treat others, how we decide to consume, to produce, to invest, to vote. They all matter and they matter a lot. So my last words to you are, let us move from fear, from uncertainty and doubt into the realm of opportunity, possibility, and meaning. And let us galvanize and, insp and inspire each other. Because if there's anything Barbara Ward has taught us is that what was previously unthinkable can quickly become reality. Thank you.